and moderate that chat. Thanks, Crystal. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another session in our virtual career fair from Junior Achievement of Southern Colorado. I'm Angie Robewood, President and CEO of Junior Achievement of Southern Colorado. We're thrilled you're here and we have an incredibly special guest. If you live in Pueblo, he needs no introduction for you. Uh, Dave Feimster is with us this morning and would love to tell you uh, a little bit more about his story. Uh, Dave is actually a retired hockey player who played for the Chicago Blackhawks and then afterward found his way as an entrepreneur uh, with Little Caesars franchises, not only in Pueblo, but also in La Junta and Lamar. And if you've been to a Little Caesars, uh, you have him to thank in, in, uh, in any of those areas because he's the one who helped bring those to life, bring those job opportunities, um, and, uh, and really help bring that, that great Little Caesars touch uh, to your community. Dave, we're thrilled you're here this morning. We are grateful. And I know you have so much on your heart and your mind to share with students about how they can build character, bring their best selves to work, um, and bring their best selves to their personal lives to help set them up for success in their futures. Well, Angie, thank you for that introduction. And I'm proud to be here with Junior Achievement because I've been a teacher in the classroom in Pueblo for Junior Achievement. And I've seen the interaction with people, the children, and man, it is really exciting to see them light up about all the things they're learning in school. Now they can apply them to their dream, whatever that might be. And I'm talking athletics or business in my, my history that it, it connects to both of those pieces. Uh, in hockey, some of the, the, the basic things that really make you a good player is being a good teammate, coming to practice every day, working hard, showing up. The coach is counting on every person to show up to be able to build a team so we can compete. If two or three people are missing, then all of a sudden you're shorthanded and now you can't do what you need to do. So when the game comes, you're not prepared. It's no different in the classroom. You know, you've got to show up every day. The teacher's counting on you and being there, being part of the class and, and being a participant of being successful as a class. So I'm just, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the basics that I've learned along the way as a hockey player and as in business and the, uh, the importance of the, the pieces that come together to be a good human being not only as an athlete, but as a, as a human being in the, in the world of civility, trying to get along with people. Uh, the reason I heard a, a pretty interesting quote that the number one reason people leave their job is because they can't get along with other people. And that's a big piece of being a good athlete or a student is that there's people around you that we don't know what they've gone through. We don't know what they're going through coming to school, parents are divorced or separated or whatever it might be going on. And to be in a, have a kind word to the people around you. And just a, being a, a nice person and inviting them to, to have lunch with them at lunchtime. To, hey, what are you doing for lunch? I'd like to have you come in and join me. Uh, just being a, a person that you, you look forward to seeing when you come to class. I hope my neighbors next to me are, are showing up today because they're really friendly and kind to me. And, uh, you know, some of those skills that uh, I remember as a kid growing up was listening. When the teacher's speaking or when the hockey coach is speaking, being quiet and it's hard sometimes because you have a lot on your heart you want to say but just listening to them and taking directions so you can be a participant in that classroom or in the in the locker room as, a, as an athlete but my dad was a paper salesman angie as a kid growing up and he used to take me on sales calls as a young boy and i didn't really know why he was doing that but i was just watching my dad and emulating what he was doing and uh, he always said dave when you're walking and you meet somebody First thing you want to do is put your hand out, make eye contact, shake their hand, and let them know who you are. Say your name. And those are qualities that when you meet anybody, whether it's in the classroom or in the locker room, introducing yourself when you, when you come to class the first time or every day, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Making eye, eye contact with the other person that you're, you're interacting with. Uh, some of the good, good prospects of uh, being a good, good teammate are... Uh, is asking questions about, you know, where are you from? Do you have brothers or sisters? What, what do you like to do after school? What's your favorite things to do at, when you're in uh, at lunchroom? What, what's your favorite sandwich to eat or whatever it might be to interact and get just to find some things, common ground about what they enjoy doing. Um, now coming to business in the first job at Little Caesars, which we hire mostly 15 and 16 year olds, most of the time it's their first job, Angie. So when they come to work, they're kind of looking to figure out what is it that you're looking for me to do? So the first thing we usually do is just 
have an orientation process of explaining here's some things that are for safety purposes, what not to touch. This is a hot oven, 600 degrees. You don't want to touch this oven, but you have to listen really well. So listening skills to make sure you're safe are very, very important when you come to your first job. And uh, our first thing that we have in our, in our uh, mission statement is little seizures must be a fun place to work. So you are going to have fun in this job. You come in here, we're going to introdu introduce you to all the stations in our operation and show you how to do things so you'll know what you're doing. So we're not going to put you in a place where you don't know what you're, you're not going to be comfortable. So we, we make sure it's a fun environment. Everybody treats you, everybody with please and thank yous. Those are two of the special words that I was growing up uh, taught by my parents. Please and thank you are the two magic words. So when you, uh, when you come in and you ask somebody a question, could you please help me? Thank you for helping me. So those please and thank you words are very important in the operation of showing respect and showing uh, that you're a good person, that you respect their, their feelings and you want to be polite. So polite, being polite, being courteous to the people around you, being a good listener, making eye contact when you're speaking with other people. It's very important because if I'm looking away from you and I talk to you, you don't really know if I'm talking to you or, or somebody else. So making the eye contact. The teacher calls on you, you look at the teacher, respond. Same thing at Little Caesars. If the manager asks you a question, you look at them and ask them, is this what you're asking me to do? So you know that it's, there's a communication going on between you and the teacher. So it, it really follows up from, from being a good student to being a good worker in a job environment. So we're looking for people that have people skills when they come to work. Mom and dad taught them how to play, say please and thank you how to be courteous, how to be polite, how to be a good teammate when they come to work. And the, uh, the, the many things that come to, to uh, being a good person is uh, sometimes you, you, know, you might say something that you regret and you, and you can say, hey, you know, I, I'm sorry. And be, saying I'm sorry is not easy to say in, in, as, you're, as an adult. So through kindergarten and fifth grade, sometimes it's hard to say you're sorry. But that is a very huge skill in the work, workforce that sometimes we make mistakes or I, I say something I shouldn't have said, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I really feel bad that I said that because that probably wasn't very nice. Will you forgive me? And, and saying those words are very powerful, whether it's on the playground, in the, job, in the job market for your first job, or even in a locker room when you're playing with your friends in a sport. Sometimes you'll say something in the heat of battle and you regret saying it, but it's okay. You can apologize and now we move on. Uh, I've had some great role models in, in, in as you have too, Angie, and uh, the people that you look up to and how they conduct themselves really is, uh, is an example for how we act. So when you look to people that are above you, teachers or coaches, and you see how they control, they speak friendly, and they, don't have, they don't raise their voice or be mean to people, you watch those people, and I've had a lot of good people in my life that have shown me how to conduct themselves in a, in a situation of leadership. And when you're a leader, every teacher, every hockey coach, everybody that works at Little Caesars, we expect to become leaders, how they conduct themselves with customers. That's very important, interacting with customers, making that eye contact, let them know we appreciate you coming in. Thank you for being a customer of Little Caesars. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Just, you know, the, the tone of voice of how we speak our words are very, very powerful. And sometimes we don't understand that the voice that we carry, that tone that we carry with us affects the people around us. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a challenge sometimes in the heat of battle when things are a little tense or, you know, there's a lot of, you know, like we were talking earlier, might have 10 cars in the drive through lane at Little Caesars, but still each customer expects to be handled with polite, please, thank you, courteous, kindness, and getting their food to them on time and moving them on to the next car. So, you know, not to lose your control when you're in the heat of battle, you stay calm, control your feelings, and handle your, your next customer just the way you did the last customer. Be consistent. Um, I think one of the most important things I learned as a young hockey player was that uh, my teammates are counting on me. If I don't show up, I'm affecting the team in a negative way. So me being there every day with an attitude of I'm part of this team, I'm going to be an encourager to the people around me, oh, my goodness, that is such a huge a huge piece of being a good teammate is your attitude. Attitude creates your altitude is what I like to think. The nicer you are, the better you are with people, the higher you can achieve a level of leadership because people are looking at people that'll treat people with dignity and respect 
and kindness and tone of voice, and they draw people to them. They're good teammates. To be a good teammate, I really believe that attitude is a big piece of that. Um, I had a friend who's a pastor tell me one time, he said, here, and these are powerful words that I took, this is about 25 years ago. He said that every room that we walk into, we have the power to change the molecules in that room mm -hmm. with our attitude, positively or negatively. So we want people that spread positive molecules whenever room they walk into, whether it's a hockey locker room, a little Caesar's kitchen, a classroom at school, the lunchroom at school, on the playground when nobody's watching, how do we conduct ourselves? Are we uplifting to the people around us? Are we spreading those positive molecules in the playground when nobody's watching? Those are critical pieces that, that make inform leaders to become great entrepreneurs and great athletes in my mind. So that, I, I, go ahead. That is, yeah, these are such powerful comments that you're making for students. First, the first thing I heard you say was just about making eye contact with people when you meet someone for the first time and how important it is to look people in the eye when you're talking to them, whether it's a server at a restaurant who comes to your table. Uh, one, of, one of the things my girls are learning to do more, I have two daughters, one's in sixth grade and one is in fourth grade, and they are learning to order for themselves, not learning, but trying to do more of that. So sure. when they order, could I please have this and looking at the server when they're talking to them and you know, no matter what environment you're in and your teachers, looking right. your teachers in the eye when you're talking to them, that's so important, makes such a difference. You, you talked about being a good friend and using kind words. So really just being a kind person, using, using the kindest words that you can in every situation on the playground or in your classroom or with your family at home, very important uh, to also do that with your family at home. And you can do that by using please and thank you words. Say please, say thank you. Those are simple words you can put into your conversations with your friends and your family that will always help for you to, to show your character. You talked about being a good listener, uh, making sure you're listening to what your friends, what your teacher, what your family is saying, and then um, being a good teammate, which is something you know about as a professional athlete. And I bet many of our students are also participating in sports. That same attitude that you would take from, from sports is what you would take into your classroom or into a job when you go there and also with your family at home, right? Uh, finding positive role models is so important. If there is someone in your life that you come in contact with that you think, I really like their job or I really love what this person is doing, you can get to know them by asking questions about their career or asking questions about um, you know, how they got to where they are in life so that you might be able to follow a similar path, finding those role models, uh, being consistent. And then, man, my favorite thing you said, Dave, was, you change the molecules in any room or the playground or your house just by walking in. And you have the power to create an environment. You have the power to change what that room feels like. And you can make it positive by using your kind words, using your pleases and thank yous, looking people in the eye, or you can have a negative impact on the room. And yeah, the yes, let me give you an have, example. Yeah, go for it. Yes, please. I have, uh, Every once in a while, if I'm white, my wife and I are talking, we have some kind of a different opinion on something, and we might be a little bit cool in the room. I'll come home, and I'll just go to the, the closet, and I'll plug in the vacuum cleaner and start vacuuming. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks at me like, okay, what do you want for dinner? I say, well, I like spaghetti and meatballs. That's my favorite. She goes, okay. And it kind of breaks the ice. And you know what? We can change the caliber of any room that we're in by just doing an act of kindness randomly to say, you know what, wow, this person cares about me enough to say something nice, go out of their way to, to make an effort to, to make the change of the molecules in that room just by a simple act of kindness. And uh, you know what, it's really a pleasure to have people like that on your team. In fact, Angie, you probably, you can't have enough of those people on your team. Every coach, every teacher, every locker room, every manager at Little Caesars is looking for that person. And, and everything you've talked about is also what your family needs. That's the energy your family needs at home. That's the energy, you know, that you can also bring into your class with your teacher every day to make it a place where other students can't wait to come to school. So you can bring that energy in each of the, each of the environments that you're in. We do have a question day from a student named McKaylee. Okay. Uh, McKaylee wants to know if, uh, let's say you're an entrepreneur 
Okay. And your warehouse is behind on orders and you're, you, you're not able to find talent to get people hired, then what can you do to get everything done? How would you work in a situation when you're behind on orders and, and you, and you don't have the workers to get it done? I'm sure you, you, I'm sure you can't relate to a situation like this at all. What have you done, done in the past in, in your entrepreneurial endeavors? That happens weekly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know what? It, and sometimes I call on my family, to be quite honest. I have my two sons that are 17 and 20 years old, and I will call them and say, hey, guys, I need you to come in after school today. We have a big order. In fact, today, Angie, we have 185 uh, pizza order and 125 crazy breads to the Bighorn uh, uh, sun uh, solar panels that they're building up by Everest today at 11 o'clock. So 100, 185 pizzas? Yes, and 125 okay. crazy breads. And so this, this is a good question for today. We, we couldn't find a lot of students because they're working or they're going to school, you know? So it's a time when in the lunchtime, so I had to bring my boys in. They're, they're, uh, one's on virtual school at Pueblo West High School. One's at, out of high school, he's 20. We I had to bring them in and, and they're gonna help us today. So sometimes you have to call on friends, family members to come in and back you up when you need help. And in this environment, it's hard to hire people. We were talking about that earlier. So we're looking at younger people going to high schools and trying to recruit younger people that are first time job opportunities for people, even though they aren't job in the job market right now, we're willing to pull them in, train them up. Like you said, count money back to customers. Math is very important in this business. Counting change back to customers is critical for having our drawers even at the end of the day, make sure our money is in place to pay for our, our food orders coming in. So right. we, we we're trying to go outside the box a little bit to find non-traditional employees to come in that are not in the workforce to get them in and help us out. But it is a challenging time. But I'll pull my family in, friends, sometimes other stores. I have to recruit player, uh, other employees from other stores to come to a store like today. We have 185 pizzas order. We had to recruit some other, play, uh, other employees to come to help us out and back us up. And that's what good teammates do. Whenever people around you need help, you step in and you help them. That's a great question and an opportunity to say, you know what? You haven't even asked me, but I, I see that you need help. I'm going to come over and help you. Mm -hmm. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness. That builds the bond of teamwork when people come in unsolicited, not asked and say, look, I know you're backed up. Can I help you? Mm, what a just privilege. Like, yeah. what exactly. Exactly. Privilege. And just like students would do in a classroom, sometimes if you're if a student's finished with work, they might say, could you go to this other table and, you know, and you can work with someone else. It's the same. It's the same mindset that you would bring into into your career, into your work environment. And Dave did say so he's looking for people 15 and up. He's looking for great team members. And he said that the number one rule there is fun. The number yes. one rule is that you have fun at work. So if you're looking for a fun place to learn uh, career skills um, and uh, and how to have a how to have a job and learn from one of the best, uh, I recommend you apply. Okay, Angie, another, you are, oh, go with, with that said, too, is when somebody does that, it's very important to thank them and let them know, man, I appreciate you coming in. You bailed me out today. Thank you so much. And, that, you know, and see, you, you touched on something earlier, Angie, saying thank you to your mom and dad letting them know you appreciate all the sacrifices they made for you to go to school, to have the things you need for sports, to be a good student, help you with homework. When you hear a thank you, an employee hears a thank you from a leader or a coach or the boss or the manager, it's huge. It's a huge encouragement to hear that word thank you. It's a simple two words, please and thank you. The two words that make open all the doors in the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Those kind words that you talked about. We have another question, Dave. It's okay. Kira from South Park, okay. she, uh, South Park Elementary School. And she wants to know what well, you talked about employees and how customers can be rude sometimes. And we've all seen those uncomfortable situations. She wants to know, how do you train employees to handle customers when they are being rude? What skills are needed for an employee to have in order to manage a customer who might be rude, especially when we know the customer is supposed to always be right, right? How do you train your staff? That's a, and you know what goes back to that piece that you said earlier that we talked about is being a good listener. Please let me know, ma'am, what it is that you're upset about. You know, because sometimes we misinterpret what they're mad about. Maybe they're upset because we dropped the ball. It's five minutes late. She had an appointment to be somewhere. Now we're going to put her late into that appointment because we didn't have our food ready. Let it explain what is that you need that I, 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 I need to fix. So just listening to them usually diffuses the anger part. And when That's you great. say something to the point of back to them saying, 
I want to help you this, in this situation. What can I do to help you? I want to make this right. And usually they'll, they'll settle down a little bit when you ask them, what is the issue? Get that clarified. Then you can figure out what it is that you need to do to fix that. that. But the key piece is not getting excited or defensive when they come at you with anger because they don't know you personally. It's, it's not a personal attack. They're frustrated about something in the job environment that we've done maybe, or maybe she's carrying something from work that she's upset about and she's taking it out on us. We don't really know sometimes where that anger is coming from. So listening, telling her, asking her back, is this the issue? So repeating back what she said, but with a tone of voice that's controlled, not upset, not frustrated, not feeding back her anger with more anger, just listening and trying to have a, a pleasant word coming back to her with a tone of voice that's calming, not to get them excited. Hopefully we can figure out the issue, settle it, and we can move on. But I think listening is a key piece, responding with a kind voice, not accelerating your emotions because you're picking on me. Why are you yelling at me? No, she's not yelling at you personally. She's yelling because she's frustrated about something. And usually it's something we have done to get them upset. So it's not like this is unmerited. If she's late and the pizza's not ready, that's on us. We take 15 minutes. It's been 25. That's on us. We got to apologize, own it, and then fix it. Dave, I love that you said that, Kira. So I hope that uh, you heard that message. Always ask, ask someone else. And this is true, I think, again, in any life situation. If you're on the playground and there's a disagreement, if you're in the classroom, if you have a sibling who you two might be disagreeing, the, the number one question to ask is, please tell me really, truly, why are you upset? Because I'd like to help you fix it. And if you come with that energy, it can also change the tone of the conversation and maybe they would be more willing. You, you start the makeup process a lot faster, right? And you know what I find, Angie, is when you solve a problem with somebody who's very upset, usually they become a, your best customer. Because you know what? Most places turn you away upset or they, they try to match your anger with their anger and that never works. But when you have a calm voice, listen to what the problem is. Try to be a problem solver, not a problem escalator. Listen. And then when you fix it, they love you. And then they tell their friends. I went to Little Cedars. They were 10 minutes late. They apologized. They took care of me. And man, that, that's a great operation. And they become your biggest cheerleaders. So I, I know maybe you guys have had friends that you've gotten in uh, like disagreements with. But you make up and all of a sudden you become really good friends. Because you said you're sorry, you're a good person, and all of a sudden you become really good friends with that person that you had an altercation with at some point before that. And it's no different with customers. When you settle a customer complaint or somebody who's angry, all of a sudden they become your cheerleader to other people around the community about here's how they handled it and it was really done well. Yeah, Kira and McKaylee had great questions. Dave, and I, I have a question for you. Sure. What, one of the things that stands out for me, for you, is you are brave. So you were, um, you were in, uh, at Colorado college, um, and you know, you were uh, playing hockey and you were brave enough to try out for the national hockey league. You were, uh, brave enough, um, to, when you left, when you retired from hockey to start a business and then to continue opening new ones, that takes a lot of courage. So my question for you is about courage and how you found that courage. But we also have two other questions from students. Um, okay. and I want to make sure we have time to get to those. Um, so courage is the first question. How, how can students find, find their courage? And then we have a couple more from students too. You know what? I had so much positive feedback from my parents that, Dave, whatever you get into, if you work hard and show up every day, you will be successful. And they drilled that into me, whether it was in first grade, second grade, learning how to read, learning how to write. If I work hard and stay at it, show up every day and bring my heart to the game, you will be successful in some fashion. Maybe not the best, maybe not the number one, but you're gonna be successful in some fashion. And so everywhere I went, I, I, I thought my parents believed that if I do this, I, I will be successful. So I started doing that in everything that I did, whether it was putting my skates on, whether it was starting a new, mm -hmm. a new business, making that team. And, and Angie, I gotta tell you, I got cut five times from the Chicago Blackhawks. I got cut five times. I got sent home saying, no, you're not ready. You're not good enough. You're not good enough, five times. The sixth time I got called up and I stayed for five years and then I got an injury to my back. But, you know, the, the keep coming back. We're not going to make the, the team the first time every time. We're not going to be the number one student in the classroom every time. We're going to fail. We're going to fall down. We're going to lose. We're going to get beat up and pushed down. But do we come back and say, you know what? I've learned something from that. I'm better this time. I'm going to work a little harder, a little smarter. And you figure out what you need to do to get better. 
So I think part of courage is, is learning how to fail, not quitting and running away, but facing up to what could I have done better? What did I do? Dif- what can I do different to be better the next time I approach this problem, whatever it might be? And all of a sudden, it may look courageous, but it's kind of like, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to quit. Have the courage to not quit. Have the courage to come back again, to try again, and to not. And when they say, no, not, not this time, Dave, you're not ready for the major, you know, you're not ready for, for this league. Right. The bravery and the courage to go back and say, how about now? I've worked hard. I've been practicing. How about now? Yeah. Okay. Do, uh, Carly from South yeah. Park as well. She wants to know why you chose a pizza business. That's a great question because you know what? It's an exciting question because I'd love to answer it because when I was 12 years old, I went to a little Caesars in my neighborhood in Detroit, Michigan. And on the, on the window, it said hockey tryouts for little Caesars hockey team. And it had a phone number. And we loved eating the pizza there in my neighborhood. We'd always go to this one little Caesars by my house. And, and my dad used to flood our backyard in the wintertime in Michigan. So we had a little ice rink in my backyard for about four months every winter. So I was playing hockey, but I never played on a team. So I thought, Dad, look, at, I could try out for a little seat. I love their pizza. I could try out for their team and maybe play for them. Wouldn't that be great? And so my dad said, OK, let's go. So we called up. We got the tryout times. And I made that team. And so... Pucks and pizzas are really close to my heart because pizza introduced me to the opportunity to play for hockey, the hockey team that Little Caesar sponsored in Detroit, Michigan. And that's where I kind of got my foot in the door to play hockey. And then this is a crazier story. In 1982, they bought the Detroit Red Wings. The Little Caesars family bought the Detroit Red Wings. And so they said, Dave, we're going to bring you home and get you home to the Red Wings. But I had been drafted by Chicago. So I I, I never did get a chance to play. I got injured before I got to play for Detroit, but I played in Chicago against Detroit. So whenever I came to Detroit, it was always a thrill to see the Little Caesars family that started Little Caesars owning the Red Wings, and I'd see them after the games. So uh, it was just, a, a you know, God working and an opportunity opened up through just uh, eating pizza in the corner in my, in my neighborhood and then introduced to the game of hockey through, through Little Caesars too. You never know where you will find the next opportunity um, or a great opportunity. You never know what, what moment is going to be that moment. Okay, David David is also from South Park. And David uh, is curious about the business name, Little Caesars. Do you know where the name Little Caesars came from? I do. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Illich, uh, Mike and Marion Illich are the, are the founders of Little Caesars. And Mike was working in a restaurant where he was in the back uh, of the kitchen area making all these different dishes. And one time he came home and he said, honey, I, I think there's something about pizza. There's something people are, it's getting more popular. This is in the 1950s. And he saw more and more people ordering it instead of chicken or fish or shrimp. Pizza seemed to be more popular. It was growing. So uh, they, they decided to open their first store and they were trying to figure out a name. And she said, well, you're like Caesar. You're here to conquer. And she, and he's only about five foot eight. And she goes, you're my little Caesar. <laughs> That's how that happened. That's the story. That's the story. So she saw these traits in him that he was not a quitter. He was not going to give up. And he was really excited about food. And he saw this pizza thing growing. And she said, you're like a conqueror. You're, you're like Caesar, but you're little Caesar. Dave, what a great story. I am so glad that Dave, <laughs> that David asked that question because I've been, always been curious. So thank you, David, for that question, because now we know where it came from and what a sweet story that is. <laughs> Dave, we have just a minute left. I would love for you to share with students just some final thoughts about how to be their best selves and uh, just some ways that, that you can help inspire them for their tomorrows. Yeah, you know, I always think of like we're every person is you incorporated. Each one of us is our own company. And how we present our company to everywhere we go, our tone of voice, our acts of kindness, listening skills, trying to problem solve, be somebody who brings joy and energy to the room that's positive instead of negative. Don't be a bully. Be kind to the people around you. And it doesn't matter where you are, in the lunchroom, on the playground, in the classroom, in the hockey locker room, at Little Caesars, we're all looking for that same person that changes the environment because they showed up. Right. And you incorporated, you, one company, me, one company, Dave, we all have the ability to change every room we walk into with our attitude and bring in the traits that we've talked about. Kindness, looking in your eye when you speak to somebody. Eye contact oh. is important. Saying thank you when somebody's kind to you. Letting your teacher or your coach know 
thank you for all your love and, and putting into me to be the person I am today. To your parents, let them see that you really appreciate that special treat they brought home for dinner tonight or that special act of buying a pair of skates or a new glove for your son. Let your parents know that you really appreciate it because that goes a long way for a teacher, a coach, a manager, or a parent to hear those words. And it makes, it makes me as a parent feel great when my son says, thank you, dad. I love you so much. Absolutely. And, and as a mom, I will also sign, I will, I will share that as well. Okay. Two more. I think we have time okay. to get to them. Okay. Um, okay. Maya from Baca wants to know what to do if let's say you have a sibling and you are in a disagreement and then you apologize to that sibling, but they still stay mad. How can you handle that? You know, I usually kill them with kindness, you know, just be kind to them. And sooner or later, you'll wear them down or they'll come around. Now, sometimes you can't control other people's emotions, but all you can, can do is control yours and your tone of voice, your friendliness. You apologize. You did everything you can. And sometimes it takes a while for them to come and meet you halfway. Uh, we've all had those altercations with siblings. I had four brothers. I was the youngest, so I, I got punched, pushed around quite a bit. And, uh, you know, when you, when you finally just kill them with kindness, sooner or later, I believe they will come around. Very good. That is, that is entirely true. What a good question, Maya. And then Jonella has a really great question. She wants to know if you eat pizza every day. I do. I'll have a slice of pizza every day when I walk into the store. I'll put different toppings on it. I like jalapenos. That's my number one favorite topping on a pizza is jalapenos and Pueblo chilies. Because we have chilies down here in Pueblo that are really delicious. And it spices up the pizza slice quite nicely. But I'll have a slice about every day and go in there and just check it out. And I still love pizza after 35 years of being in the pizza business. Pizza every day. So there you have it. True story, Jonella. He does eat pizza every day. Um, uh, what my daughter always loves to say that pizza is a good food group for breakfast because it has a carb and it has a protein. Um, and if you put the right things on your pizza, it can, it can, it can be a, a healthy treat, right? We like your daughter's thinking. Oh, every day. She wants it for, and uh, every day. And of course, <laughs> it is, um, it's a wonderful, uh, you know, what, what insight the Eliches had to say, hmm, you know, uh, was it 30, 40 years ago? And they thought pizza seems to be growing. People seem to be liking this. Uh, mm -hmm. What a great business mind to, to take a look around and see something that people were continually buying and eating and say, I should maybe make a pizza business. I bet I could make some money doing this. And of course they have uh, in, in credit and, and philanthropists. And they also give back to their community as well with the dollars that they have earned through their business, which is um, a massive business. Uh, is Little Caesars international? They are. They, they've, they've been over to uh, Mexico for quite a few years now. They've gone to South America and they say they're going to enter into the uh, uh, European market this year too. So they are growing internationally and it's, it's, it's fun to be a part of it, to see the growth since uh, they started in 1959 and I've been there since 85. So it's been an exciting run to see the growth and, and the people that love our product coming back over and over. It's just a pleasure. To, it's a great business to be in because the customers come in and they're happy. They're sharing food with their family. It's a real positive business model. So it's really a joy to go to work every day. Absolutely. Dave, you are um, you are such a wonderful resource and advocate for students. And I would encourage students to think about your career path and how Dave's words can support you in your future and what you might want to do when when you grow up or when you turn 15 uh, and look for your first job. Um, some of this is, is not too far in the future for you. That that time will be here before you know it. So Dave, we thank you. We thank you for being here. Students, teachers, thank you for joining us today. It's been wonderful um, to, to have you with us. And thank you so much to those brave students for asking questions. That's part of the courage that Dave talked about. You're, you're well on your way. You've, uh, you can check off the bravery box today for, for being willing to ask those questions. Um, and thank you all for being here. We are so grateful. Dave, any final final comments? You know, I'm just so proud of the teachers, the frontline heroes in our, in our country. They, they come every day and it's not been easy with figuring out the computers and the virtual piece. It's been very difficult, but I've seen attitudes of so, so positive to stay engaged, to keep reaching out to the students, to try to impact them in a positive way, even in a tough environment. So I tip my hand to all the teachers. Thank you for your efforts and students. Keep bringing your heart to the game. That is the game changer. You just show up with your shoes and your hat and your, no, you got to bring your heart to the game. And when you engage, you will become successful at some level. 
So don't you know, stop coming to work or to school with your heart. Bring your heart to the, to the game. The teachers recognize that and you raise your hand and ask questions. They love that engagement. So please bring your heart to the game and be the best you can be. Brilliant. I, I can't say it any better. Bring your heart to the game and be the best you can be. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful day today. Thanks, Ange. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate you being here so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, teacher.